So I'm Ashish Kothari. I work with uh, Kalpavriksh in India and I'm speaking to Patrick Bond, a very well-known climate researcher, climate justice activist from South Africa. Patrick, uh, you've just come and we're sitting in this beautiful campus of Wagashisi University in, uh, in Istanbul in Turkey. I hear, Patrick, you're just coming from some of the most disastrous climate-related events in Southern Africa. Can you just tell us briefly about them? Yeah, I mean, it's just shocking. The last month, Cyclone Ide hit Daira, which is the main port city in the middle of Mozambique, the third largest city, and uh, submerged about 90% and, and continued into Zimbabwe. It also affected Malawi. That's uh, 1,100 deaths, uh, estimated $2 billion to infrastructure and damage. Uh, it even shut out the electricity supply to South Africa because of power lines that went down briefly. I mean, this was uh, such a wake-up call because um, the clear uh, indication of climate uh, change as a, as a catalyst here was the rising temperature um, in the current right offshore. It's the second most violent current in the world, the Agolas current. And, um, so for the first time a major uh, category three hits, it was actually the second worst uh, storm recorded. And then, just as we speak now, the worst is underway. It's further north, uh, not as uh, uh, intensely populated, uh, the area now hit the city under fire, I think the most is Pemba, uh, but it's going from northern Mozambique now into Tanzania. Um, we don't know the damage, but uh, the wind uh, speed hit 220k. And in between, just as I left, in fact the day I left, at Durban to come to Istanbul, uh, Durban was hit by a rain bomb that was about 100 and uh, 70 millimeters in 24 hours. In fact, one area south of Durban had 235 millimeters. Um, that's about a sixth of the entire annual rainfall just in that one day, and it just demolished the shack settlements that were on the sides of the rivers or um, the mudslides that uh, took down uh, uh, houses that weren't well structured. There were a few of the wealthier people who had high profile in this uh, on the beach whose houses were destroyed, but the 70 plus deaths, as far as I know, were all black, um, low income uh, South Africans. So, the environmental injustice of these um, weather events is now just palpable. It's really time for a climate emergency. Even the president of the country, who got rich as a, as a coal mining tycoon, Cyril Ramaphosa, said as much that this is. This is climate change. Many of the state agencies are beginning to realize it. However, they continue with business as usual on fossil fuel exploration, including offshore Durban for oil. Uh, major new coal mines are being opened. Coal-fired power plants are being built, the two largest on, in the world right now, 4,800 megawatts each, Madupi and Kusile, are being completed. Um, there's just a billion barrels of oil found offshore. Fracking exploration continues. Uh, we are really fossil addicted, and we, one main reason is we haven't pulled a climate justice movement together. There's sort of weak climate action. The Climate Action Network has some activities, but we've, we've not done a good job in spite of the uh, obvious ways that uh, race, class, gender uh, coincide with, with climate. So just explain that a little bit, because you use the term climate justice, and that's not a common term that a lot, a lot of people are hearing climate change, global warming, some actions should be done, but the term climate justice has a very specific connotation. Can you just explain that a little bit? Yeah, it comes really from environmental justice and the roots in the phraseology would be African Americans being victims of PCB poisoning in a place in North Carolina in the early 1980s and, a, and an awareness emerged of where the pollution is and it is uh, inexorably uh, under capitalist uh, uh, pollution uh, um, dispersal in poor areas where real estate values are lower. Uh, they're uh, also uh, racially um, uh, biased uh, pollution indicators where people of color, uh, black people, are, are uh, subject to more pollution. Now when it comes to climate, there's a reflection from the early 2000s uh, the first time I think the, the term was used was in an Amsterdam conference in 2000 uh, that climate change will have uh, just as uh, extreme uh, biases in the way it hits the poorest uh, people of color uh, and indeed the people who did the least to cause the problem of 
creating uh, uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions. So it's the uh, politics of saying um, if you are working against climate change, and we're seeing now such a wonderful revival of, of uh, intense climate activism and extinction rebellion, we're seeing this awesome rise of the youth uh, in the Fridays for Future climate strikes. Let's make sure that the uh, race and gender and class uh, characteristics of the way climate change affects people and, and the beneficiaries of climate change, those like me in the global north, who, even though I live in Johannesburg, but we travel and we have a high consumption uh, um, obligation, I think, to pay some sort of climate debt. And we have to start figuring out how we do that and how we build the movement so that the uh, climate debt is part of a, of a struggle to make sure uh, there's a just transition and make sure no, nobody who especially has been adversely affected uh, is going to um, uh, be left behind on this. And this, this climate debt, I mean, this whole, the, the, the approach to climate justice and then specifically the term climate debt is not in the Paris Agreement, right? Unfortunately, our elites, uh, including the African elites who went, uh, basically sold out to uh, Barack Obama when in 2015 uh, he persuaded through a guy called Todd Stern, his State Department manager of the United Nations Framework Climate uh, Convention on Climate Change, to not uh, have binding emissions, to have no accountability systems, to not include the military or uh, shipping or air transport, to um, essentially leave huge gaps that make the Paris Climate Agreement a farce. But maybe worst of all is that if you sign it, you are agreeing to forego any claim to liabilities. You're uh, accepting that the loss and damage of climate change is on you, and you agree to waive any climate debt claim. So it's just one of those appalling power relationships in the UNFCCC that we saw from Copenhagen. We saw it in Durban in South Africa when in 2011 we hosted COP17, and we really felt that um, the conference of polluters, in a way, uh, had uh, managed the process so that uh, the big boys who can continue polluting, the US, uh, Canada, the EU, Japan, Australia, Saudi Arabia, and not just the northern, uh, but also the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, all joined in and left poor countries behind and bribed and cajoled. Thank goodness we have WikiLeaks, which produced lots of records of Todd Stern, his emails to Hillary Clinton, his State Department cables that really made clear uh, this was a stitch-up. Uh, the Paris Climate Agreement was a profound letdown for the reason of climate debt and so many other reasons. Well, with the kind of resurgence you're talking about of public action with uh, Extinction Rebellion and Fridays for Future, uh, would they be, you think that they can bring in the whole climate justice and debt issue? I mean, very quickly, if you can... Yes, I think climate debt is the most serious that my generation owes to future generations. So there's a generational rage that is being expressed by Greta Thunberg and all the kids who are coming out, um, it's so overdue, it's so welcome. And climate debt has to be part of the discourse on a temporal, uh, generational level. But then, of course, it'll be more and more clear to these activists the more mature they are. And the more they fight power, that they're fighting white, male, corporate, European and US power and the BRICS. And that power struggle will put them, I think, uh, in a more conscious mode. I think Extinction Rebellion has been asked very explicitly by climate justice activists to take on board uh, privilege, the privilege of getting arrested without uh, too much consequence, but particularly the need to say, uh, as we fight climate change, we're not going to go for false solutions that empower bankers like carbon trading. We're going to go for the kinds of uh, just transitions that are global in character and that protect women and, and people of color and the, the working class who are the main victims. So uh, you're talking about just transitions. Um, I think one of the criticisms people like us have always been faced with is that you guys are really good at saying no and protesting and resisting and all of that. But what are you saying yes to? So what's your alternative? What would a world look like or a society look like which is climate friendly, climate just, etc. So you, uh, you've done something on that in South Africa. Can you tell us a little bit about well, that? We've made a, a, a small step forward, my colleagues, especially at the Alternative Information Development Center. I think they'd all agree that we'd look to you first, Ashish, and to the group of uh, the researchers and activists and acknowledge and all of the uh, forces that are at the grassroots level forging their own struggles, making demands that 
a point, clearly, to a just transition. But yeah, at some point you have to map out, okay, well, what would this look like? A Green New Deal is the phrase sometimes used in the North now, or um, we've had various philosophies behind what a transition should look like. Summa Kose in the, in the Andes, or Buen Vivir, as it's often called, or the Gutes Leben of uh, Germany. There's lots of ways these can be thought of philosophically and in programmatic terms. So for South Africa, Million Climate Jobs was set up about um, uh, nine, ten years ago before the, the South Africa host of the uh, UNFCCC. And it became a pamphlet. We had a particularly uh, useful ally, Jonathan Neo, who uh, fashioned a similar project with uh, British Labour. Um, and there's a brand new version of it, about a year old now, that we I think is, is you know, up to date. It uh, specifies how we can go from about 530 million tons of CO2 equivalent emissions down to about 120 in a relatively short period, and in the process make transitions that will create um, at least a million jobs. And these are in transitions in, in energy from coal and other fossil fuels to uh, solar and wind. Uh, we would uh, strongly promote a, a public transport revival uh, for tens of thousands of jobs, an agricultural restructuring towards more organic and less pesticide and fertilizer based fossil um, dependent agriculture, cities that are more compact, um, ways of doing production that are more labor intensive, less capital intensive and much less carbon intensive, um, and then uh, changes in consumption norms, uh, new disposal systems, zero waste is the philosophy. Uh, these are some of the arguments uh, in a pamphlet called A Million Climate Jobs. Uh, people can find it at aidc.org.za. And my colleagues who put that together and continue to do lobbying now are, I think, ahead of the times and uh, hopefully with the awareness now of this terrible calamity of, of extreme weather, the, the cyclones that hit uh, Mozambique and the, the rain bomb that has just slashed Durban uh, in KwaZulu-Natal. These are the opportunities to say, climate emergency, here's a plan, let's move forward. We are having an election on May 8. Regrettably, we don't have a serious debate about climate, but maybe the last few days will contribute to changing that. Well, it's the same in India. We are having elections right now, and climate is hardly on the agenda. But just quickly, this one million climate job. So this could be actually a great way of putting together two allies which have unfortunately not been allies, uh, which is the labor movement and the environmental movement. Do you think this could bring them together in some way? Yeah, let me just use two examples to illustrate, because one is a very, very well-known uh, green group. I'm a member of Greenpeace uh, Africa, and uh, the other, the National Union of Metal Workers of South Africa, 350,000 strong, the, the, the largest trade union in South Africa, very militant, which uh, NUMSA, the Metal Workers Union, has had on its books a very strong commitment to a just transition with socially owned, community controlled, worker self managed uh, local grid development. Uh, so there's no question in theory <clears throat> that's there. Greenpeace has done very good direct actions. <clears throat> Pardon me, just uh, stuck in my throat. <clears> throat> Three, two, one. <clears throat> Greenpeace has had very strong direct actions in the past, but um, unfortunately came out in favor of a privatized solar system of the government. And that's where there's been a terrible clash between the, the green and the red. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, the maturity that's going to be required to deal with this can be found initially in fusing green and red in, in, in coming months and, and you know the, the dilemma is partly that um, there is such desperation with a 40% unemployment rate uh, that the coal mines and the, the coal fired power plants are in a part of the country that isn't the ideal area for uh, solar grids and wind but these are the sorts of things we're going to just have to sit down and work through yeah. maybe after the electoral distractions we'll have a chance to do that. That's great. What's the slogan you came up with yesterday, uh, which you have in your, in your rallies in South Africa? The way we express the most extraordinary history of fighting against apartheid, fighting against big pharmaceutical companies which denied ex, uh, affordable AIDS medicines in the 2000s, uh, fighting uh, against privatized water and electricity, fighting against excessively expensive uh, tertiary education university fees, and in each of those struggles, victories, not all the way, but, but most of them a full, full victory to, uh, to celebrate 
what we say is a mandla, a mandla, mandla which is power, a wetu to the people. A mandla, mandla a wetu. Right. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks uh, a lot. We'll see you in South Africa. Thank you. Yes. Right.